Um, are you recording? Cool. Can you pass the sheet out to you? Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. So we're going to go through diagnosis here. Um, I made these laminated copies. You guys can keep them in the room just in case you ever need help figuring this out. Because um, diagnosis is definitely a little more complicated than you would think. So I just made extras. I don't know how many rooms you guys have. but. Um, all right, so when we talk about diagnosis, you'll notice I see I have here on it saying for the general dental team. And that is because this really is a team effort. So when I define the team here, that is the front desk or reception, whoever takes that first phone call. It's going to be the assistants who are doing the testing. It's going to be the hygienist who also could be doing the testing. It will be the dentist, and then this weird guy named Brian is here too. But besides that, <laughs> this really is a whole team effort. And the reason why is I think about 95% of endo cases can be diagnosed before I even come into the room. What you need is a good history, and you need a couple x-rays, and most of the time you can figure out what's going on. Now, diagnosis is way more an art than a science, and I wish I could just tell you, well, if it looks like this, then it's like this. But you guys already know the easy ones. Big cavity needs a root canal. Big hole in the bone needs a root canal. It's in the gray area where it becomes really complicated, and so it's okay to be frustrated. I know that we're having this talk because there have been a couple cases that were sent over. Uh, we don't get mad. This We have literally, we tell patients, we see about two to three misdiagnosed cases a day from everybody in town. So you are not alone. <laughs> so don't ever feel bad if you send one over and I send it back of, hey, it doesn't need a root canal. We're totally used to that. But hopefully with these, we can kind of give you an idea of a couple different things to watch out for. So what we're gonna talk about is kind of three different things. The first is kind of endodiagnosis for how you're going to talk about it to the patients. Second is endodiagnosis of what the AAE says we need to do, and that's the top part of that sheet. And then the final is what we actually do at the office. So when we talk about the endodiagnosis, you have the nerve and you have the bone. That's kind of one of the weird things is we actually separate out the two parts because they are different. So with the nerve, if we talk about how we're gonna explain it to a patient, you can have a nerve that is healthy. You can have a nerve that's kind of angry, but it can get better. You can have a nerve that's angry and it's not gonna get better. Be dead, it's pretty obvious with that one. And then, oh, someone else has already been inside here and either started the root canal or has done the root canal itself. For the bone, we're not only looking at what the x-ray looks like, but also clinically. That's one of the weird parts with the periapical diagnosis is that it's two parts, both what the x-ray looks like and what it feels to biting. So you can have healthy and it looks good on the x-ray. You can have healthy, but it doesn't look good on the x-ray. Those are a weird one. You can have unhealthy and also doesn't look good. This is where it gets a little confusing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, it can be draining into the mouth. Those are pretty obvious. It can be really bad and swollen. Those are always fun because then there's pus everywhere. And really, these are the ones that are going to need treatment. Obviously, if someone else is already here, it could be a retreat, but we're not going to talk about that today. Most of the time, it's, it can't recover and it's really painful or it's dead. And from the bone standpoint, there's some infection going on. So let's talk about those nerve diagnoses, or as we call them, pulpal. So when it comes to pulpal diagnosis, Cold is king. That is how we're going to test everything. I will show you guys how we do the cold test in a minute because that is one part that is a little bit hard is how you actually do the cold test. There's no like systematic way like how long do you hold it on the teeth, how long do you spray it. As long as you use endo ice and a cotton pellet, you're pretty much golden, but I'll talk about how we do that in a minute. So the first question is, does it even feel cold? Okay. If it does feel cold, how painful is it and how long does that pain last? And then if it doesn't feel cold, why? Okay, so those are the three questions you'll ask. When we go through each of the diagnoses, I'll kind of go into that more in detail. But here's my unpopular opinion. Most teeth that feel cold don't actually need a root canal. The question is why? Well, the reason why is we know that bacteria can travel through the pulpal system at about a millimeter a day. Just what they've done, they did a fun test where they hook it up and put the bacteria in and watch how fast they eat. So they eat about a millimeter a day. Average pulp chamber is about five to six millimeters deep. And you know from when you do a pulpotomy, the cold sensitivity goes away. As soon as you get the nerve out of the coronal part of the tooth, it's not gonna feel cold anymore. So if bacteria have entered the nerve, are actively eating it away, they're going to feel cold and have severe cold sensitivity for let's say a week, and then it goes away. How many of you have had a root canal done before? How many of you have had that experience? exactly what happened to me yeah I did yeah sometimes it, <laughs> it doesn't go away but I had severe cold sensitivity when I was in college I have a Denza Dente on seven really really bad I was outside playing 
ultimate frisbee because of course that's what we were doing in college and i remember yelling for the frisbee it was late at night and this tooth killed me so painful it was during like right before finals week though so i couldn't get home couldn't get to the dentist by the time i got home i was feeling good again Fast forward to about a year and a half later, right after we finished the endo talk in uh, dental school and huge swelling <laughs> and the tooth is dead. <laughs> so I thought like a lot of our patients do, cool, I beat the root canal. But if you, that's one thing to look out for is if you have it, oh, it's really been cold sensitive and then it goes away, that's actually a bad sign. The good signs are the, oh, it's been cold sensitive for a year. That's not bacteria, that's inflammation. And so when we talk about inflammation, I like to use this curve and once again, the, this topic right here is a year-long course that I teach at St. Louis for the endo residents. <laughs> you guys get one slide. So it's okay if this is a little bit confusing. But what we want to think of is on the x-axis on the bottom is going to be inflammation. So on the left-hand side, these are cases where they have no immune system whatsoever. And on the right-hand side, these are cases where the immune system is ramped up. On the y-axis, it's going to be what we call morbidity or how bad the response is, okay? When we look on the left-hand side, we're talking about people who have very low immune systems. So end-stage AIDS, chemotherapy, the elderly, comorbidities, things like that. And what's going to happen is when they have an infection in a tooth, it's the huge swelling and, you know, really bad, this is the really bad cases. On the right-hand side, though, these are the cases that we see all day long. This is the hyperinflammation, the patients who have sleep issues, the people who are all seen on that side of the building. <laughs> they're going to have a chronic inflammation inside there. And with that, they're going to be more likely to have flare ups, especially after crowns or any restorative work as well. So kind of think about this when you're seeing patients. Go ahead, you're fine. <laughs> is that on the right? Bye, Bill. Bill, you'll be on YouTube one day. It'll be fun. <laughs> On the right-hand side here, that's where a lot of those really, oh, it's been sensitive for a year, teeth live, okay? All right, let's get into the fun part that you learned in dental school and hopefully promptly forgot, which is what does the AAE say are the actual diagnoses? So, for cool. For cold, it's the clinical findings, which is normal pulpal tissues, normal response. Normal response, I put it in quotes because that could mean it doesn't feel cold. If you have a 90-year-old who's had five crowns on the tooth and you put cold on it and it doesn't respond, does it need endo? Probably not. <laughs> if you have a 15-year-old with a wide open pulp chamber and you put cold on it and it doesn't respond, that's a very different story. So you have to kind of think about what the patient is and what they're bringing in with them. Next one is symptomatic reversible pulpitis. That's a lot of words. It's all Latin. So let's take it one by one. Symptomatic, it hurts. Reversible, it can go away. Pulpitis, irritation or inflammation of the pulp tissue inside there. So these are, it's going to hurt to cold, but it doesn't last that long. And my definition for not last that long is about that 15 to 20 second period, depending on how anxious the patient is when they come in. So kind of that's my number is 15 to 20 seconds. And that leads us to irreversible pulpitis, which is now it's not fixable. Now we need to do a root canal. And this is where that cold sensitivity lasts longer than that. Okay. I'm going to show you how we do cold testing here in just a second. But that's, this is your really big differential is between the reversible, we can fix it by doing a couple different things, or it's going to get better on its own versus irreversible. Okay. Pulpal necrosis, it's dead. Pretty obvious there. Previously treated, it's previously treated. Previously initiated, it's previously initiated. Those are, those are pretty obvious ones. <laughs> um, that's pretty much your pulpal diagnosis, okay? I know this is where a lot of people get eyes glazed over. This is where I got eyes glazed over in dental school. So um, any questions so far? Fantastic. All right. So my final recommendations for your pulpal testing is get a good history. I'm going to show you in a minute when I talk about what we do, how that's done. You want to ask the question, does the tooth have any sensitivity to hot or cold? And the reason why we include both of those in there is that there are different nerves inside the tooth. The nerves that most that first get hit are very sensitive to cold, but they also die first. The nerves that then get hit next are sensitive to hot. So one sign that the tooth for sure needs a root canal is, oh, it used to kill me to have cold on top of there. And now the only way I can get this tooth to stop hurting is by putting an ice cube on top of there. If you hear that, it 100% needs a root canal. That's a very easy diagnosis.
Okay. You're nodding your heads like you've all seen this before, which is awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, when you ask about the cold sensitivity, how bad is it? Because there's a big difference between, oh, when I have ice cream, the spot that has recession on it hurts versus I can't talk when it's cold outside because it's so painful. I can't yell to my friend to throw the Frisbee because it hurts so bad. Okay. Then your clinical exam, pretty much, is there been any recent work? We know if you literally touch a burr to enamel, there's inflammatory processes that go on inside the nerve. If you literally just take a tooth and zap it like that, there is response of the pulpal tissue, which is kind of crazy. The weird studies that they do, I swear. <laughs> now, does that mean it needs a root canal? Not necessarily. But when you do a crown on top of there, you create a lot of inflammation. And so it's normal that the tooth is going to be sensitive. It's just how bad is that sensitivity and how long is it going to last? Um, also, you want to think about deep caries. If it has an obvious, I'll show you some very obvious cases. You don't need a cold test to really deep caries case. Don't torture patients. If you know it needs a root canal, just send it out. It's these weird in-between ones that when we do the cold test. We were talking earlier with um, Jenny, and did I, I didn't use cold today. Did I use cold yesterday? Maybe once? I mean, so I don't use cold on all patients because most of the time with a good history and the x-rays, we can figure it out. And there's no need to torture people who are having a ton of cold sensitivity because of deep cavity. Okay. And then the final one is fractures. That is another hour and a half, two hour lecture in its own. <laughs> if the fracture is deep, and what I mean by deep is when you look at it, is there debris inside the fracture? Okay. Is there gunk inside there? Those are the bad ones. If I can give you a very simple if this, then that. If there's gunk in the fracture, that's a bad day. You're much more likely to split the tooth at that point. Because think about it, for the fracture to have broken that much, there's going to be something going on down inside there. Okay. I can always come back and talk about fractures, but we have wine to drink get to, so we're not talking about the day. All right, let's talk about endo ice. Do you guys have endo ice here? Or some off-brand one? That's fine. Um, if Actually, Edge has endo ice for like half the price. Works really well. It actually smells better too. I like the mintiness. Yeah, so <laughs> um, you can use anything as long as it's cold. However, how you apply it is very important. When I was teaching in residency, a um, student came up and was like, Well, I sprayed the tooth, but the patient can't tell where it's coming from. I was like, How can you not tell where it's coming from? Like, it's pretty obvious. And so I was like, Well, can you show me how he does it? So he goes up and he's got the spray and he goes, in the mouth, sprays directly in the mouth. So I don't think any of you are doing that. <laughs> I have some great stories from people. I'll, I'll tell some more stories tonight. Uh, best one, if you want to come out for wine tonight, is I will tell the story of the time a student lit a tooth on fire. Um, yes, that did happen. Yeah, I can't believe you haven't heard that one. I have not heard that I was going to say. You, I, <laughs> OK, so when we do endo testing, the most important thing is do not use a Q-tip. Do not use a cotton tip applicator. Why? That's kind of. This doesn't hold cold. That's plastic. This holds cold. So what we want to do instead, this. Okay. Make sure when you do this that you have cotton on the end of the forceps. I've seen it before where the cotton ball is like up here, and the student then is like, I don't know why it doesn't work. I can't get it to you know. The, the metal is not going to conduct it like this. When I go to do the cold test, if I'm worried about them being sensitive, here's how we do it. That's it. Zip. Did you feel it? Not yet. All right, now we're going to hold it on the tooth. Okay. A lot of times I've seen, especially with the student, this is a this is a dental student, another one. They'll be like, oh, it's really cold sensitive. Well, show me how you do it. Well, they spray it and then they just go, no. Of course it's going to be cold sensitive. With that. <laughs> so you want to do just kind of a quick zap. That's all you really need to do to get that first test. And you will know then, because if it's that quick and their response is to jump out of the chair and grab the tooth. That's a case that probably needs a root canal. If they're like, eh, all right, it's back to normal, that's probably something else. Okay. All right, let's do the bone diagnosis. This is even more confusing because it's real fun because there's two things we have to do. So this is the periapical one. For this, you want to say, what does it look like on the x-ray? So that. Actually, this is oh, this video I'm still editing, but that'll be posted soon. The surgery on that one—that was a fun one. That was a, that was a big beast. <laughs> um, actually, we just saw her back for sutures. Um, what does it look like on the x-ray? Does it hurt to biting? It's pretty much your two questions you're going to need to figure it out. Once again, unpopular opinion, I don't think every tooth that hurts to biting needs a root canal. And that's because we can all, we've all probably had a tooth that hurts to biting when we're stressed out or if you had a high filling or something placed, you don't necessarily need a root canal on there. And the reason why is exactly what we talked about before, that inflammation thing. If you're going to be more inflamed from whatever it is, it's probably more likely you're going to have pain on top of it. So 
Let's talk about the approved diagnoses. First one is normal. There's no pain to biting. I like the normal ones. Those are the easiest ones. <laughs> um, symptomatic apical periodontitis. More Latin here. Symptomatic, it hurts. Apical at the bottom, periodontitis, inflammation of the area that holds the tooth in place. Okay, So that means it hurts to bite it. I oftentimes will send back cases that say SAP, but they don't need a root canal. And that's because if you have pain to biting, it doesn't necessarily mean you need a root canal. Okay? You have asymptomatic, which means it doesn't hurt. There's no pain to biting. There is something on the x-ray. We'll talk about that in a second. You have chronic apical abscess, which means there is a sinus tract present, which is that little pimple that pops up next to the teeth. In those cases, usually by the time the pimple has popped through, it's kind of like a pressure release valve. So those bacteria, as they divide, they're no longer locked inside the bone, and they actually kind of poke through the gum tissue, and then it stops hurting. So you'll often hear, oh, I had a ton of pain, and then all of a sudden I popped this thing, and now I feel better, and I, I'm good to go. It's also a sign something needs to be done at that point. And then acute apical abscess, that's the one that everybody loves, the swollen shut eyes, the huge, yeah, those are, those are the fun IND ones that we get to do every now and then. So there also is something called condensing osteitis. We see it maybe twice a year, maybe three times a year. Sometimes in patients, instead of getting a black spot on the x-ray when they have inflammation, they get a white spot on the x-ray. That's pretty much all it means. Instead of walling it off by creating a space inside the bone, the body instead makes it more dense. Just so you know all the different terms inside there. I don't even think I put it on your sheet because it's very rare to have that. <laughs> okay, now that was the clinical side. We also have the x-ray side, okay? Guess what? Normal is normal. It's great. Symptomatic apical periodontitis sometimes will have a finding, sometimes it won't. This is where people get confused, okay? Sometimes you can have a big spot on there and it hurts, and sometimes there's no spot at all and it hurts. That's the beautiful thing about it. If it's asymptomatic, but there is apical periodontitis, it means there's a black spot on the x-ray. So if you just finished a root canal on a case that has a black spot on the x-ray and someone saw it the next day and it wasn't hurting, they would say it is previously treated with asymptomatic apical periodontitis because it takes some time for that area to heal. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs treatment if there's a black spot on the x-ray either. Chronic apical abscess, that's where you have the sinus tract. Sometimes you can see the spot, sometimes you can't. The comb beam helps a lot here as well. And then finally, we have acute apical abscess, where there's almost always going to be some sort of spot on the x-ray because there's going to be a big infection. And then as we talked about, the condensing osteitis, there's a white spot, so the black spot. Oh, that's, you got a clock out, Jenny. That's, <laughs> we're recording this on my phone, so I'm using her phone for three months. <laughs> Sometimes she's a workaholic and she stays at the office too late, so it is officially 4.30 and Jenny can go home now, which is good. All righty, so any questions about the lovely diagnoses that we have to use for insurance, insurance purposes? Fantastic, you guys are awesome because most people are falling asleep by then. So let's talk about the fun part, which is when does a tooth actually need endo? Tooth needs endo when the nerve inside the tooth has died. And that's usually from either bacteria, which can be from a cavity or a crack, or from trauma, which kills it and you have sterile necrosis. Okay, that's pretty much how it is. So Whenever you're seeing these cases, you need to think, how did bacteria get inside here? Okay, so I think there's kind of like three different levels as far as this. We have your straightforward ones. There's a cavity. There's a nerve. It hurts really badly. I'm not going to cold test this one. This is what I did earlier this week. <laughs> okay, that one's pretty obvious. Deep caries. All right. Next one is obvious apical. Fun Everyone knows there's something wrong here, right? I did this root canal and this root canal. This one she came with. Clearly, there. This was a big cyst that we had to clean out. So that one obviously needs something as well. These are pretty easy. Huge swellings. You guys have no problem diagnosing these. These are not where the hard part is. Okay. And then, obviously, sinus tracts, little pimple next to the tooth. I should have put a fluff on there. I meant to, that's, I forgot to put a photo. Everyone knows what it looks like. It's a pimple next to the tooth. Oh, yeah, exactly. I, maybe I could, that's how I could get famous on YouTube is popping sinus tracts. I don't even know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, more complicated is when it's multiple teeth. So, looking at this bite wing, which tooth is causing the pain? Just take a guess. Because here's what I see. I see number 14 has a crown on it. It's already had a root canal. We don't know what that looks like. Oh, by the way, the patient came in with pain on the left side. Somewhere. Up, down, can't tell. Um, got a pretty deep amalgam filling on a second molar, which just means it's more prone to cracking. Uh, really close to the nerve is there as well. We have a beautiful looking crown with a giant overhang on the side there. Massive cusp. These are both zirconia. And then we have a very deep margin here on 19. So 
which tooth is causing the problem? It's a little bit tough to tell in these cases. In her case, it was the massive cusp on these tooth. We flattened that out and it was all back to normal. So um, multiple teeth, especially if it's referred pain, are always difficult. You all, are you all familiar with the referred pain concept? Cool, excellent, good. Um, recent crowns restorative also makes this a little bit harder because we don't necessarily know what it looked like before. Did it have a really deep cavity? And usually you can, you guys can figure that out because you can look at the x-ray and see what it was before. I usually have to guess and talk to them and say, why did you need the crown? Was it a deep cavity, a crack? And then you can kind of suss out what it's going to be. And then the final one is, as we talked about, cracks. That is a whole lecture on its own, but pretty much, like I said, debris housing, bad day for everybody, okay? And then with the multiple teeth and referred pain, I like to use kind of a splinter analogy with patients. So what I say here is, imagine you get a splinter in your hand, you get that red spot around there, okay? That's why it refers to different teeth. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna pull that splinter out, but just like with its hand, it's gonna take a few days for it to go back to normal. Sometimes people do need multiple root canals. They may need a couple of root canals, but it's difficult to tell. And so what I usually do, if it's kind of a difficult diagnosis, I'm gonna do the most obvious one, if it's, you know, if it's unambiguous and then call them a few days later and see where it is, and 99% of the time they're back to normal with that. So, okay, the cold test really does help. This is where I mostly do my cold test, is try to see what these teeth are. I tested all of those teeth, except for 14, obviously, because it had a root canal, and figured out which one was the actual problem, and then the biting test also makes a difference here. All right, let's talk to the fun part, it's just muscles test as well. Um, Tammy's not here, so I can actually talk about it, which is good. I was gonna say how to do an airway exam, but I wasn't gonna do it in front of her. Um, <laughs> Pretty much, and I'll allude to this later, you want to test both the masset and the temporalis. You want to push with about four pounds of pressure, which is just enough, whereas if you put it on a hard surface, it starts to turn white, just in case you want to do it. Put it on the table, look and see when it goes there. That's about how much pressure you have to push with. It's actually a little bit more than you think, and you want to feel for kind of a little bit of knots. Push and hold, and oftentimes the teeth will hurt. I actually have a spot over here that if I push just in the right way, it makes number 12 hurt. There's nothing wrong with number 12. I just need to stop clenching and grinding, which is why I'll see you guys next week for my airway stuff. Anyway, all right, let's talk about recent crowns. It's one of my favorite memes to use online, which is adjust all of the teeth. We started off just with gold back way, way back when, I think even before Nettie's time. And then we went to, <laughs> I had, I had to, come on. <laughs> yeah, you have a whole mouth of gold, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've known Nettie since I started working in this town. Just a, just a heads up. So I'm, I think I'm allowed to say that, but yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And gold is really nice because it's so soft. If there's a high spot, it'll just wear away over time and it might be sensitive for a week or so and it's good to go. PFMs are more of the same. Because it's a softer porcelain, it wears over time. Our two more recent ones, lithium disilicate or Emax, and then zirconia in particular, are so hard, they're gonna take all the force that would normally just wear away at the tooth structure and they're gonna push it into the tooth itself, okay? What we need to look for when we're, and what I usually have to adjust, is what are called the non-working cusps. So for people in class one occlusion, not crossbite, that is going to be the bull. Does everyone know this term? Just remember this giant longhorn, which is, well, why did that go on that way? It's the buckle of the upper and the lingual of the lower, which is what I have on your sheet as well. So. If you have a recent crown done, if you see a lot of zirconia and they're having that kind of weird cold sensitivity, but it's been going on for like six months, what I recommend is checking for both frematis, which means you put your hand next to the tooth, have them grind side to side. The molars shouldn't move. If they have proper canine guidance, the molars shouldn't move. And oftentimes you'll see in recent crowns that were done, it hits super hard. Um, you guys aren't using CAD cam, right? Or are you? Perfect, cool. When you get to CAD CAM, talk to me because there's a few things when you're training, you guys will probably be doing it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the, and I'm sure you guys know this at this point, but if the assistants are doing it, this is where you, I found this out when I worked at the other office, is if you just press the auto button, the, it's really good with a scan of getting the centric occlusion, and then what it tries to do is build up these massive cusps to get the buccal or lingual to touch. And what that does is creates these huge interferences. This whole lecture and this insane part that I'm talking about is me studying this for like the last nine years because I'm so confused as to what was going on. Um, so that's gonna be part of the thing is how it's designed. And with zirconia, it's even more important to do this because if those cusps are high, it's gonna put all that force either onto the opposing tooth or onto the one that you're working on as well. 
So I always like to say, imagine if every tooth had an implant inclusion, how much better the world would be. <laughs> if you want to fix all the root canal problems in the world, give them all implant occlusion. The periodontists were just A, they totally stole it from the oral surgeons, for sure. B, they were amazing at saying, oh, well, implants can't have that lateral load on it, so you have to give them implant occlusion. And I'm like, why did we not say you have to give it endo occlusion? That would fix 99% of the post-operative problems. Anyway, sorry. I'm going to get up, <laughs> step off my soapbox here for a moment. <laughs> so uh, as far as the very complicated cases, these are going to be your oral facial pain. And thankfully, you have a lovely lady here who will take care of that for you as well. <laughs> so on the ones where it's a little bit complicated, that's where you can kind of ask Amy for help. So. Finally, let's say, what do we do at our office? And I'm going to have Jenny help me out here as well. Um, first off, if you guys want to quick scan the QR code, I'll give this to you as well if you want. That's the copy of this. So if you guys ever run out of these or whatever, you have that available. Um, I'll get it to you so you can print them off more if you need. I made 10. I think that's more than enough for the office. But um, just in case you need them, it's kind of useful just to have in the room to as a quick, or if you have a new employee that doesn't know it. But more importantly are those questions on the bottom because that's how we kind of go through everything. They are a little bit small, so I'll kind of read them off and just start off with these are the questions that we teach the staff to read. Um, Jenny can kind of talk about it, but pretty much we don't ask all of these questions one after the other. Usually, just start talking. Right. <laughs> all right. Don't ask Yeah. Um, but by just getting the gist of what's going on, I always ask the patient to tell me a little bit about what's going on. Oh, God. <laughs> this last time I had it on, I did karaoke. It didn't go well. Um, I always ask the patient to tell me a little bit about what's going on. And by those taking the three minutes to explain what's been happening, I can get if it's sensitive to hot or cold, how long it's been going on, if it hurts when they wake up in the morning, if they wear a night guard. So all of those questions lead me to ask. Have you had any recent work done? If you do wear a night guard, how old is it? Has it ever been adjusted? That type of stuff. And this is really, this is helpful for the front desk as well. If you're screening emergency patients coming in, this is kind of going to be, you can keep one of these up front, obviously, and just have that available to you. So these are where we teach them to ask, where's your pain located? Figure out if they had a recent work on it. You know, oh, the oh the crown that Dr. Amy did. Just went, which Amy was it? <laughs> <laughs> I heard you got yet another Amy. That's even, the, that's just, you guys have too many Amy's. Yeah, I love it. Um, rank your pain one to 10. And a lot of times those low level like, oh, you know, it just hurts every now and then versus, oh my gosh, it's killing me. Those are pretty obvious ones. Um, does it ever wake you up in the middle of the night? That's a good sign because if the tooth is undergoing pulpal necrosis, what will happen is those bacteria don't care if the sun's out or not, and they will be eating away. And spontaneous excruciating pain is one very clear sign that a root canal is necessary. So I like asking this question as a screening tool on over the phone. Is your pain increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? Because if it's getting worse, we know that something clearly is going wrong. If it's decreasing, well, it's probably going to be okay on its own. And then staying the same is the, oh, I've had cold sensitivity for six months sedation. Does anything make it feel better? This is where that hot and cold question comes in. Oh, putting cold on it makes it feel so good. Okay, probably needs a root canal. Um, oh, if I take a bunch of ibuprofen, it makes me feel better. Oh, that's probably a good sign as well. Oh, if I wear my night guard, it makes it feel better. Okay, these are kind of obvious terms as well. Do you currently have temperature sensitivity? We say that because hot and cold can both cause that, and that kind of gives you an idea of what the patient might be going through. Does it hurt to bite? That's going to give you an idea of what the uh, periapical diagnosis is going to be. Has the tooth ever had a root canal? This is a good question as well. This is more a question for me, but I'm just gonna give you the questions that we ask so you know what we do. Do you feel swollen? A lot of times swollen to a patient is different than swollen clinically. <laughs> I think you all know this. <laughs> so ask, you know, oh, I'm so swollen down here. Well, feel the other side. Oh, I feel swollen over here too. Well, you might just have a big neck. That might be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In that case, you might have to go see the airway side. <laughs> Mm. You, you have the great you you know what i'm gonna have the doctor check that for you yep <laughs> punt <laughs> get away from that yeah um are you currently taking any medications this helps me know if they've had antibiotics or anything like that and does it help is any part of your tooth missing this is a good one for you guys up front of are we going to potentially need a crown or what it may be um when's the last time you're at your dentist is also a good one because it kind of helps us figure out if they're actually there <laughs> um have you recently had any dental work done in this area and then the final one do you currently wear a night guard that helps get us an idea if they may have some bruxism or sleep issues going on as well okay when we do the radiographic examination and that we don't once again 
that was a lot. I just want to give you all the questions that I think can be helpful. You are all incredibly smart people. You can pick and choose and figure out which one you want to do. <laughs> but I really like Jenny's technique of tell me a little bit about what's going on with them. And that gives the patient the opportunity to even check off like 10 of those questions right there and have a good idea of where they need to go. Any questions about that, especially from the front desk side? Awesome. Cool. All right, radiographic exam, which is uh, PA and bite wing. Um, I love the bite wing. It is my most, I probably use the bite wing more than I use the PA at this point because the PA, <laughs> really, we do it for insurance purposes because we have to send them in. I use the comb beam on every patient, so I can get a lot more information out of, from the comb beam than I can from a PA. But the bite wing tells me a lot about how the teeth come together and what's opposing it. So PA, I always like to look at the coronal part first. Don't immediately jump to the apical part because that's what we all like to look at. You want to see what the existing, and try to figure out, could bacteria have gotten inside this nerve? Okay, that's always going to be your thought, except for trauma, obviously. And then the bite wing is going to tell you the story about what else is going on in their mouth. Okay, is there a giant, you know, if you see a white tooth and it's, you know, zirconia on the x-ray and it has massive cusps and everything is flat, well, I think I figured out the problem. <laughs> Versus, oh, they got a huge cavity and they need a root canal as well. Comb beams are absolutely fantastic. Um, we do take them on every patient. And like I said, we do a limited field um, just because I don't want to look at all 28 teeth at once. So keep it small. Um, and on that side, you got to take it for everybody, but you send them over to like beam readers or somebody like that. Do you guys take a lot on the general side? Okay, yeah. And that's if you, it's for you too. If you want to learn how to read comb beams, I'll talk to you. <laughs> but, uh, Great question. If it's isolated to a tooth, or if we have a tooth on there and they say it's just this one, just that one. If it's the left side, we'll do both. Yeah. Good question. And then sometimes if it's like, oh, 3, 9, 15, 25, like I could just take the whole scan. <laughs> and then I'll be in my office for 10 minutes trying to go through every single tooth. Because you have to, that's part of the issue is if you are the ordering you know, doctor on that, you're reliable, you're responsible for everything in that image. So that's why on the airway side, they send it out to, uh, you know, someone else to take that for them. On the general side, you kind of have to do it yourself, unfortunately. So that was what I would say for companies. And then pretty much like I said, if you have a good history and you have these images, we're about 95% accurate. That's why I don't have to do the gold test too often. It's just to confirm in certain cases that the root canal is necessary. Okay. Extra oral examination for this one, I kind of do like an airway scroll. Oh, shoot, Amy's here, so she's going to hear me. Good, she's not paying attention. Good. Um, how I do an airway screening is not how they do it. It's I just watch them talk. Is their tongue having issues? Do they have a lip tie? Do they have a jaw? Or is their lower jaw, you know, back here? Or is their upper jaw back here? Kind of watch them as they talk and see if they're having issues, just, you know, even talking or if their tongue, if, they're, if you, they walk in and they're like, <sighs> Okay, they might have an airway issue because their tongue's, you know, massive. So that's kind of the quick and dirty way to do it if you're suspicious about it because patients who have airway issues are going to be those patients on the far right hand, right hand side of the inf inflammation and they're the ones who are going to have the pain after a crown is done, after a filling is done, and they're going to need some extra TLC. For the muscle exam, it's how we talked about. You want to do that four pounds of pressure, push down until you see some blanching in your finger, and masseter and temporalis are pretty much all that you need to do. I sometimes will do SCM if I'm concerned about them, you know, with head posture causing issues, but most of the time, that's going to give you a good idea if they're going to be more prone to hyperinflammation. So I do this on every single patient. Even if we're, if I know they need a root canal, I'm still going to check the muscles to see if I'm worried about them, and I'm still going to do that airway screening with big heavy air quotes to see if they're more prone to needing some extra help after. Okay. Sometimes you can do the TMJ and really, I think I've sent Tammy maybe two to three legit TMJ patients, like TMD, like they have actual problems in their joint. Most of the time, if they say, oh, I have TMJ, it's my muscles are hyperactive and sometimes it hurts down here. You sometimes can check if it's, if it's posterior pain, is like 14, 15, 2, 3. Sometimes it's the TMJ that's actually causing it. Um, just push on it and see if it hurts and then send it to her because she'll do the actual exam that actually matters. <laughs> um, okay, so intraoral exam, not always necessary. Like, does this need a root canal? Yes, this is my first patient today. It drained like crazy. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, you don't need to do a complicated, you know, a crazy exam on a patient like this. Um, if we are going to do it, I always like to start off with a bite test, which is just using a little tooth sleuth, 
have them bite down on the tooth because if you start off with cold, they're not going to like you very last. Save the worst part of the exam for the final part of the exam. So we always stop with the cold. <laughs> um, bite test first, front his chest like we talked about, put your finger next to the tooth, have them grind side to side, see if it moves way more than the other teeth. That could be a problem as well. Occlusal check, you just use some paper and kind of check. You're going to want to look at those excursions for sure because that's usually where you're going to find the issues, especially with recent crowns like we talked about. And then as far as Perioprobe and Explorer, I will sometimes do it, especially if I'm concerned about a crack or if I'm concerned about a couple other things. But most of the time, you're going to get your good information from your bite test and from just kind of looking at the x-rays. And then finally, cold. And when I do cold test is when all the, if I'm still not sure if the tooth needs a root canal after doing all of these other testing, the history, the x-rays, all these exams, that's when we finally do the cold test and figure out, is it necessary? And I would say the number of times where I get a positive response to cold and it lasts forever, we maybe have one a month. Because at that point, we're so good at kind of figuring out which ones actually need it. And most of the time, I, this is most of what I see. I mostly see dead teeth like this. <laughs> this is, that's about, and retreats. It's retreats and dead teeth. It's like bread and butter. But those cold ones, that's where it becomes a little bit easier. Yeah, kind of more complicated. So how do we put all this together? <laughs> so what I recommend is that your front desk is going to screen using some sort of questionnaire, get an idea of where they may be, present that information to the doctor. The assistant or hygienist is going to do some of the testing. You make maybe appropriate images. Um, I know for sure hygienists can test. I'm pretty sure assistants can test in this state with no issues whatsoever. So you can do all the testing. That'd be totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> Don't give me. Once, once the recording's done, we'll talk about, <laughs> about the issues of the dental board in the state. Um, I may have to bleep that out. <laughs> And then your doctor is going to confirm with the final testing if needed after. So that's kind of how we like to do it. As far as the conclusions, not every tooth is sensitive to cold. It's going to need a root canal. You want to check the occlusion. Look for other factors like airway, recent crowns, things like that. If you're going to cold test, use the cotton pellet like we talked about. Periapical diagnosis requires both clinical and x-rays. That's one of the most annoying parts about them is you need to have both. And on your very difficult diagnoses, 99% of them are airway. I'll just tell you that right now. So at that point, any questions? What if a patient says that their tooth is throbbing? Throbbing. Throbbing can be a multiple, couple different things. So throbbing can be, the reason you have throbbing is because every time they're, um, Heartbeats, the pressure is increased locally in that area. So that was actually my first thing is when I would I went for a run and all of a sudden my tooth started hurting. And that's because when I was running, my blood pressure increased and it pushed on that expanding area inside the bone. So throbbing can be you have an infection starting and it's starting to cause that issue. It can also be if you keep hitting too high, if the occlusion's high, it can cause it as well. A really easy way to test that is just do the cold test. Because if it's dead, well, that's where you get that swelling pain. And if it's just from occlusion, the cold test will tell you right away because they'll still feel it. Mm -hmm.